Welcome everyone to the um, Quant Financial Engineering Podcast. I have quite a treat for you tonight. I have um, uh, Ariam uh, Tatsat, Zach Riari, and Brian Yakalchik, who have worked on um, a very interesting uh, project having to do with uh, uh, interpretability and reinforcement learning, applying to a, a trading environment. Um, I am going to let uh, Ariam start by giving a brief introduction uh, and then uh, telling us uh, all the elements uh, around uh, the topic and then what what was his idea. Then uh, we'll let uh, Zach and Brian and Ariam obviously uh, explain a bit more what they wanted to do, how they did it, and what they ended up doing. Now, it's quite interesting. You should be aware that after they did this, this um, piece of research as part of our uh, MFE capstone, they were, uh, the, the, the article, uh, the research was published. So it's, and it's gathering uh, attention in the community. Um, anyway, Ariam, I'll leave it up to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Patrick. And good to be back on the podcast. Uh, so, as you mentioned, this project was related to interpretability of uh, an enforcement learning based model, which we use for algo trading. And taking a step back, looking at the bigger picture, uh, what we have seen, and this is something I mentioned in my last podcast as well. So, there is this explosion of machine learning models uh, because of the faster computer, data algorithms. But at the same time, especially in finance, what we are seeing is that there is some pushback. There's some pushback from finance fraternity or business. What they say is that uh, the models might be like black box or uh, the interpretability of all these machine learning models might be less. Now, talking about all these reinforcement learning models, uh, I mean, we can, of course, go into more detail into this, uh, all these terms in the, throughout the podcast. But... Yeah, I mean, reinforcement learning model, they are more autonomous. It's kind of a new kid on the block used exponentially. I mean, in terms of the use cases, there are a lot of use cases in finance uh, now and it's growing exponentially. But at the same time, because of the autonomous nature of all these reinforcement learning models, it's kind of even less interpretable. It's even more black box. So uh, the idea for this project was like we tried or, or we made an attempt to kind of dissect or understand or do a deep dive into all these re uh, reinforcement learning models and uh, try to do some uh, like interpretability of uh, an application of reinforcement learning model, which was like uh, algorithmic trading, which is something which uh, quite uh, used or, or which is growing exponentially, uh, as I mentioned. So uh, that was the overall purpose, understanding or dissecting what's happening inside a reinforcement learning uh, model for trading. And all credit goes to the team for uh, amazing work, Zach and Brian uh, here. And of course, we can uh, discuss all these terms uh, or these buzzwords that uh, I yes. mentioned. Yes. In fact, as you mentioned, Aram, you mentioned too, maybe you could situate for the audience where reinforcement learning sits versus you know, machine learning and, and, and deep learning. So people have a feel for the yeah. granularity of this thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, so AI, machine learning, deep learning, all these are buzzwords. So AI, uh, I mean, we can make, you, people can always go to the previous podcast that uh, we did, where I described all these things in detail, but just giving a quick summary. So AI is the superset, machine learning is a subset of AI. And deep learning is a subset of machine learning. And RL or reinforcement learning is a type of uh, uh, machine learning. So just like we have supervised and supervised, similarly, we also have reinforcement learning, which is uh, a type of uh, machine learning. And, and, and talking about or just giving uh, or defining what is reinforcement learning, this is a very simple uh, kind of uh, approach we follow in reinforcement learning, just nothing but uh, maximization of reward and minimization of losses uh, or, or punishment uh, without any supervision. Uh, that's what we do in uh, reinforcement learning. It's kind of very intuitive because if you think about all the action that we perform, generally us as human, uh, those are like driven by some reward. So all the action that we do are kind of driven by uh, a reward. And that is what happens in reinforcement learning and uh, 
going slightly more technical, uh, there are a couple of components of reinforcement learning, or in, in case you are trying to implement any reinforcement learning, there are a couple of components which are like agent, reward, reward uh, environment, uh, state, action. So what essentially happens is uh, that an agent uh, takes an action in an environment uh, which has a state variable and, or, or a state, and it tries to maximize uh, the reward. So if you take an example of uh, trading setup, uh, the agent would be a trader, uh, action would be buy, sell and hold, uh, reward can be the overall money uh, the trader wants to make. Uh, the state would be all these uh, input parameters or features like stock price and volume and stuff. So essentially, essentially what the algorithm is doing, it's trying to maximize the reward, which can be the amount of money a trader wants to make. Uh, depending on all the state variable, like the stock price and everything, uh, that is fed to the model. Uh, yeah, so that's that's basically what our reinforcement learning is. Okay. And then you mentioned the other word, which is uh, interpretability. Yes. So why is it needed in finance? What, what, what how do they fit together? Yeah, so I, I guess, I mean, Zach and Brian, in case you want to add Zach, anything. you want to feel talk free, to yeah. Brian? Brian, go ahead. Sure, yeah, I'll chime in. Um, so, as Harry mentioned, um, there's been pushback in the finance community. Um, these models may work in a, in, a, in, in a kind of a in a tech environment where you know repercussions might not necessarily be um, the loss of a, the value of an entire portfolio. Um, and so, understanding why these things work, um, kind of twofold. Um, really, the first thing is there's there's capital at stake. Um, the big, the big names, uh, the, the banks, asset manager, whoever it may be, right? Can't just uh, take a bunch of money, throw it in a black box algorithm, um, and then lose a bunch of money and say, "Oh, I'm sorry." Uh, understanding really how they work um, from from a capital perspective is extremely important. The other thing um, is that not everyone um, in the community is necessarily a, a programmer, not, not everyone is an AI. Uh, not everyone is an AI specialist. Um, so for these models to be able to be implemented and kind of convince leadership uh, and, and present and be presented to a non-technical audience, um, it's important to have interpretability uh, and the ability to dissect what's going on and then communicate that um, to someone who doesn't uh, know how to code, doesn't understand AI, but is trying to derive, um, is, is trying to pull, um, pull insights and actions from from, uh, from whether it's RL or AI in general. Yeah, I, I, those are good points. I'll, I'll just like to add a couple of more points or they might be a repetition of what Brian already mentioned. In finance, we have money at stake, uh, also repetition, right? So historically what we have seen is uh, a small glitch in the model can lead to uh, bigger consequences, be it like flash crash, or even if you think about subprime crisis, it was kind of a failure of uh, some of the quant models that we had. So it's very, very important to have deep dive uh, to, to know what's happening inside uh, the model. And one point that uh, Brian also mentioned that it's, it's very difficult to sell a uh, less interpretable model in finance. What I mean by that is, for example, so, something that uh, uh, it, it's something which is talked quite a lot, uh, like a loan default, right? Or, or let's say an, a, person goes to a bank uh, to take a loan and the bank says, no, we can't give you a loan. Then the person asks why you can't give uh, me a loan. Uh, the, the bank cannot say that it was because my machine learning models say that, right? They need to explain them. Uh, they need to explain that person that why uh, the loan was rejected, right? So that's, that's, the, that's one of the example why uh, interpretability is needed. Similarly, if you're doing a trading strategy, if you're like uh, a strategist on a desk, you're going to portfolio manager or maybe a, an investor, and you say that, hey, this is my trading strategy. It works pretty well, shows good back testing. The first question that will be asked is, why do you think that uh, it makes a lot of money? What's the intuition behind it? What's the driver? Whether it's uh, uh, like, or mean reversion strategy or momentum strategy. So these kind of questions are asked. And that's why we think uh, that in, in all the application, almost all the application of finance interpretability is important. 
and and i just want to give like example of extreme scenario we don't want to be in a situation sometime in future that there's this market crash because if once a trader sitting in one of the corner of a hedge fund office and uh, his machine his or her machine learning model uh, goes wrong right so we don't want these kind of situation to happen and that's why uh, we we need interpretability or understanding of the model especially in finance so essentially you guys try to show that it's not really a black box anymore and that it it can be okay to use it in a way yes uh we are not saying that it will be perfectly okay to uh use it yeah uh-huh. it's just an attempt towards deciphering or or peeling the layers of onion more and more right so the more we go deeper the more we understand so that was our attempt and let me give you some background of uh, the interpretability or the techniques of interpretability so we have uh, supervised learning unsupervised learning uh, already uh, in mach- as a part of machine learning which is something which is used extensively and uh, when it comes to interpretability uh, technically speaking there are two ways of doing interpretability one is you look at the entire model level that hey why model is performing the way it is or you look at the decision level like if one particular loan is defaulted why it is defaulted so that's that's how we look into interpretability and there are some st- industry standard when it comes to supervised learning like shapley value lime even if you think about like uh, artificial neural network there are some industry standard now the problem here in reinforcement learning is that the number of parameters are pretty less so when their number of features are huge generally that's the case in supervised and supervised learning it's kind of slightly easier to decipher what's happening uh, but in case of our problem statement or in case of reinforcement learning the number of parameters are slightly less right so it becomes challenging so what we tried to do was we tried to take a totally different approach rather than doing something quantitative we tried to do something which was uh, more visual and uh, as a step 2 or the next level would be do- going more quantitative but uh, just to answer your question uh, we we don't say that it's completely interpretable it's just like attempt to make things interpretable and we can talk about it in more detail okay zach so um what was your involvement what 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 how did you go you guys go about doing it uh yeah so our goal with the platform i guess in a way was to kind of make it as easy as possible for the user to be able to interpret um, those actions that the reinforcement learning agent was making. Um, So with that in mind, we kind of went with a modular approach to uh, partitioning the data into kind of digestible sections. Um, And we did that through creating an inter-episode, intra-episode, and um, testing data tabs. So just to touch on each tab real quick, um, within the inner episode tab, we give uh, we, ha- we have a tab sidebar view, um, which allows access to three different graphs. Um, one is a two-way table for comparing over any two episodes that you can then choose with um, individual sliders on that side view. Um, a state delta graph that kind of shows how often the agent bought or sold um, or held given a change in price or volume over episodes, and then a scatter plot for showing um, the agent's action given the volume and price deltas. And all the, all the graphs, by the way, on each of the three tabs, um, they're dynamic because of the options to change the data set based on the year you want to observe. Um, and by choosing any two episodes for comparisons, um, except for in the testing tab, because um, it doesn't iterate over episodes for for the testing data. So, um, I'm sorry, but which which when you say which date which data you um, did you use for this? Uh, we used primarily three different data sets. We used um, a Vanguard ETF, and we used pre-COVID 
COVID and post COVID trading data. Um, and the primary state uh, values that we used were price and volume. So that's what we fed into our neural network. When you say the user, I'm assuming you mean the trader or who's the uh, user? Yeah. The, this is the data that we um, kind of uploaded to our platform so that the user can then change the data sets that they want to visualize um, using each of the three tabs. But so when you say user, uh -huh. who do you think the user is going to? Oh, I see. Um, well, the user really, depending on what the use of um, the platform is for, could be any anybody. Um, I mean, if we, we did it with finance in mind, but if, uh, say, the user wanted to better understand how an autonomous boat was trying to go around a loop, um, rather than using price and volume as a state, they would adjust it to whatever they're using, maybe wind speed, maybe tide current direction. Um, so the user itself, we had finance in mind. So maybe a trader in go live situations could um, upload their uh, data set or stream it live um, and adjust parameters to their model um, and see how different parameters might affect um, how the agent interacts with its environment. So it's, it's almost as if you would expect to have this sitting with the trader so that they could what? Double check themselves or make a decision and decide whether it made sense or not based on what uh, the RL told them they should have done and should be doing? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's certainly a possibility, um, I would say. Uh, it, it, it would be more so for um, kind of getting an idea of how changing one hyperparameter is going to affect the agent. Um, with that modu modular design, we kind of have it set up so that changing one variable adjusts the visuals so they can get an idea of how that might affect it. Um, adjusting it for go live scenarios, I suppose could be done, um, but this would more so be for testing a model, getting a better idea of your RL agent. Um, so it's before you do the trade before, okay, so it's, it's not, okay. So it's basically you're testing, you're thinking about a trade or you're thinking about a reaction and you can, you would be using your model to, 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 to play around. And what are the variables again? You mentioned price and volume. Yeah, the variables could be anything. Um, I mean, we were- But in this particular instance, you used- Price and volume. Okay, so what, what we essentially tried to do, as in, uh, Zach explained us, it, it pretty well, uh, but what we tried to do was that we wanted to check during the test. So the reinforcement learning model, there is like test phase and then training phase. So first it trains and then it tests. So we wanted to check whether the training is intuitive or not. So during the training phase, we, we prepared a grid kind of stuff, right? And the grid was, assume the grid has on the x-axis, the change in the price. So there were two parameters, change in price and change in volume. On the x-axis, it was change in price. On the y-axis, it was change in volume. And uh, we had this heat map. Uh, we had this grid point with different uh, granularity or, or like, like a high granularity for both volume and price. And we wanted to check that with this movement of volume or change in the volume or the change in price, what is the algorithm doing? Uh, whether it's buying, selling, or just holding, is there some intuition around it? Can we figure out some zone where uh, the algorithm is just buying or algorithm is just selling? So for example, let's say the price goes down and the volume also goes pretty less compared to let's say previous day, then what, what is algorithm doing? Is there some pattern that we can visualize there or not. So that's what we tried to do. And we tried to do that both during the training phase as well as stress test phase. Why training phase? People generally do these things during the test phase while actual live trading. But we also wanted to check whether uh, the algorithm is doing something intuitive during the training phase as well, whether things are intuitive. So with each, let's say, episode, what's the change in that heat map, whether it's becoming more and more intuitive or not. And then of course, during the live trading, whether or, or during the test set or test phase, whether the algorithm is doing what 
it should be doing or whether it's intuitive or not, whether it makes sense to us as, as, as let's say traders, right? So that's what we tried to do. It was more visual, I would say rather than quantitative, uh, at least for the first part. But what uh, Zach and Brian did, they did a really good dashboard. And you, in the dat dashboard, that, that is what Zach was explaining. You can change the hyperparameters. Uh, so there are a couple of uh, uh, hyperparameters that we have in the model, like discount factors, the number of layers and nodes of the neural network, and see what's uh, what's the impact of these on the the training of the model, whether it's making things more intuitive or not. So let's say there's a trader who has this great dashboard. He wants to, he or she wants to train the reinforcement learning model. They can tweak all these hyperparameters and train the model again and again and see whether it's something intuitive or not by looking at the heat map. So it will give an idea of the interpretability, whether it's just a noise or whether there is some pattern, a pattern something, a, a pattern which, which a trader has seen before, whether it looks like a momentum or whether it looks like a mean reversion. So that's what we tried to do there. Okay. Uh, what about the architecture itself of, um, because you mentioned, uh, you mentioned a new word, you know, hyperparameter. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I guess we are throwing quite a lot of technical terms. I know, I know. But uh, yeah, I mean, hyperparameter is uh, something that you set before you run any uh, machine learning model and you can't change it, right? So for example, the number of layers and nodes uh, that you're using, if you're using neural network, the number of layers and nodes is something you set upfront and you can't change it during uh, the process of model. That is what hyperparameters is. Uh, hyperparameter is. So you're talking about the... Uh, architecture uh, and and of course Zach and Brian can add uh, that the some of the hyperparameters some of the obvious ones because we are using something called deep Q learning, which is based on deep learning. Uh, there is this neural network uh, which maps the state to action, and of course because it's a neural network there will be layers and nodes, uh, so that is one set of hyperparameters. Then we have uh, something called discount factor, uh, which or or which, which basically decides whether you want to focus on long-term gain or short-term gain. Uh, then there were a couple of other things like window size and the number of uh, uh, episodes that you want to train. So this is called parameter tuning or hyperparameter tuning. So we want to have the best set of that. And this is something that happens in the supervised learning space as well. Whenever you're building any model, uh, you have to decide the architecture of hyperparameters first. And you change these hyperparameters, tweak these, and see which one is giving the best result. So that with the, with the dashboard uh, that we have, uh, we can tweak these hyperparameters, uh, which we set in the beginning of the training process, and see whether the final output is making sense or not. And that is something you can check by looking at the heat map I just mentioned, and we can talk about the results or we can talk about some of the things that we have observed. So one, one thing was that uh, we got a little bit of idea of uh, overfitting. And of course, Zach and Brian can add more detail. Uh, when we increase the number of layers and nodes or when we had quite a lot of hyperparameters in the model, uh, what we saw was that the model was sort of moving towards more overfitting. And, and that was one of the uh, like result, I would say, and the idea of any model would be to avoid overfitting. And that's why tweaking all these hyperparameters was important. Goes back to the importance of the dashboard that we had. You can easily tweak the hyperparameters rather than going and changing the code. So any trader, they can tweak these hyperparameters from the dashboard and see uh, what's the impact on the trading uh, or, or the training of the model or the final outcome of the model. I wanted to just add on to that um, a little bit architecture in terms of the tech stack that was used. Um, so in terms of kind of the need for computational power, given a GQN, um, a GQN algorithm, um, we use the Google Collab um, space and um, so obviously good, uh, good use of the, of the free Google GPU um, that's provided. Um, in terms of um, the front end, um, 
we used a framework called Dash in, uh, in, in, in Python, which is uh, essentially an HTML, CSS, and JavaScript wrapper that makes front-end development super easy uh, for folks who are kind of native to the Python language. You don't have to go learn um, the, you know, the traditional front-end tech stack. And then for you know, databasing, um, staying within the Google space, uh, we used BigQuery to um, uh, store um, all our output. Um, and then obviously within the, having a Python backend, it's really easy to use the Google API to integrate obviously the front end, um, the Google BigQuery backend uh, database um, into, uh, into a web app that's um, both scalable and uh, very dynamic uh, to use. So Zach, what was, uh, I remember talk a little bit about some of the findings, any, so once you guys set it up and got it running, what did you find? What were your discoveries? Yes, yeah, so um, our primary discovery was the overfitting. And I guess just a, a, a brief overview of what overfitting is. Please, is, yes, I was gonna ask that. Um, when, during the training phase, you're fitting that model with the data that you're feeding into it. So overfitting occurs when um, the model can no longer uh, differentiate between the training data um, or it can't generalize to the testing data from the training data. It overfit in that sense to the training data. And um, yeah, I guess that's kind of what overfitting is. And so what we found uh, as, as a conclusion almost from our project was that when we increase the number of layers of the neural network, um, the number of hidden layers of the neural network, uh, the model is overfitting for whatever reason. And we were able to um, find, make that discovery due to the heat map that the Her that Harium uh, described a little bit. It was showing all cell. Um, and we determined that to be due to the overfitting of the data, the training data um, in, that, in that testing uh, tab. So practically speaking, Arian, what does that mean for the trader that's using it or that's testing it? Yeah, so the trader should be really aware of this overfitting thing that uh, Zach just, just described. Uh, the trader should have, uh, should tweak all these hyperparameters and run it a couple of times, do this trial and error, and make sure that the output or uh, this heat map is kind of intuitive during the training process and also during the test process. Uh, so that's that's something uh, a trader can do, right? And uh, in terms of intuition, uh, of course, uh, if you increase the number of layers and nodes, if you increase the number of uh, parameters or hyperparameters in any model and the number of data points are less, then model will overfit because uh, the dimension of your input or observation is much lower as compared to the dimension of your of, of your model. So one thing or one takeaway for trader would be if to do this trial and error and see whether the heat map is making sense or not. And the second takeaway is also from the intuition point of view or uh, uh, the understanding of uh, the model architecture. And if you increase all these layers and nodes, you can of course uh, dump as many number of layers and nodes that you want. Uh, it, but but the intuition here is that it should be aligned to the input data that you're using by just throwing more number of layers and nodes you will not get a really good model or it might there's a chance rather there's a chance that uh, the model might uh, overfit so there are two uh, outcome for or, or there are two result i would say for any trader on a very high level one is uh, the training can be done by tweaking all these uh, hyperparameters and, and use the dashboard and, and look at what's happening during the training phase and test phase. And second is also build some intuition around uh, what, what would be the impact of changing the hyperparameter, whether it will, it will overfit, whether it will be good for the final model or not. Zach had mentioned earlier in the conversation, I mean, we, because we're talking finance, we're talking trading, but he also mentioned boats and, 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 um, and selling, so this could be really, right? It could be used for for many um, many instances, many situations, really. 
Yeah, what I was well, what I was pointing out was that uh, the way the platform was designed, um, it can be used for a variety of types of data. Um, so the heat map, um, that idea came from another uh, research paper that was working with turbulence and flying an autonomous plane um, and determining kind of how the, the plane reacted to different levels of turbulence. Um, so this way of visualizing data is not specific to finance and it, it can be set for a variety of different types of data sets. I mean, um, Mendel brought in his in his book, the, um, in his book, uh, talk about turbulence as well. Uh, and I wanted to expand the discussion a bit because what so because what is next in this project? What what else would you think you could could be doing uh, going forward, Aaron? What would you like to? Yeah, so this, the scope of this is kind of unlimited. This is, as I mentioned, uh, it's a new kid on the block. Everybody's talking about interpretability and we, it's just like starting point, looking at uh, things visually, right? So we have to go deeper. And by that, what I mean is there can be three, four uh, direction that we can think of, right? So the first one is what we have used so far is the price and the volume, right? And you can throw in all, by, all kind of... Uh, variables there, maybe sentiments, price to earning, technical indicators and whatnot, right? So that's one direction. So we can see, uh, we can put all these state variables and see what happens to the model, whether it's learning better or not, whether the heat maps are looking good or not. And that will also add to the interpretability because we might be able to attribute the final result to the parameters, meaning that, okay, we, we say similar to supervised learning that the money that we are making is coming from the sentiment, which is the input, uh, more from sentiment rather than volume. So that's one direction, adding more and more state variable. Second thing is understanding the hyperparameter impact. So that's something we touched upon. Uh, we looked at what's happening when we change the layers and nodes, but we can do, go even deeper into it. We can try, uh, to understand what's the impact of hyperparameter, not just on like the deep Q learning model that we have used. Again, I mean, this is kind of technical term, but yeah, I mean, this is one kind of reinforcement learning model that we have used. We can use a bunch of reinforcement learning models. They will have different hyperparameters. Some will be even better than what we have used. And there we can have uh, more insight into what's happening in when we change different hyperparameters. So that's that's more like model tuning that we do in uh, the supervised learning kind of uh, setup. And the third thing is going more quant uh, quantitative, right? So as of so so far, we were sticking to something which is kind of visual, uh, looking at hyperparameters. Uh, but we can so all these. Uh, uh, reinforcement learning models have artificial neural network inside. And there are ways to dissect all these artificial neural network. There are a lot of methodology coming from other areas, be it like uh, image recognition, computer vision, and uh, all, all these kind of stuff. And we can use it to dissect the artificial neural network that we're using in reinforcement learning. So that can be another direction. And, and we can be, so these are the like three concrete direction where we can go. And there can be more, we can, we can think of like even more creative stuff. So for example, we can train RL on some of the previous data or some of the previous uh, things that have been successful in, in algorithmic trading. And we can check whether the algorithm is learning things or not. Right, so we can compare the strategy that reinforcement learning model comes up with against the strategy which have been successful in the past. So this is something which is more creative, uh, but again, there might be a lot of thoughts which might be needed on this, but the previous three which uh, I mentioned might be more concrete and, and more uh, like solid direction to work on. Okay, very good. So I think you have a new team uh, working on steps too, and we'll see what uh, what they come up with. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Ariam, Zach, Brian. Thanks thank for you. having us. Okay. Thanks for having us. Yep.
Thanks. Thanks, Zach. Okay.